You are listening to Nate the Hate on YouTube, iTunes, Spotify, and Google Podcasts. Be sure to like the video and subscribe. We are trying to get to 15,000 subscribers before the end of the year. And today we have our first dedication for our episode, and that dedication goes out to Shamsa, who donated a very generous $300 in support of the channel. So thank you, Shamsa, for your generosity. And they left a very humble and simple message of hi. So hello, Shamsa, and thanks again for your donation. We will read the rest of the Streamlab questions at the end of this episode, so stay tuned for that. And today I have with me my co-host, MVG. What's up, mate? Great to be here. Thanks for having me on again. Always a pleasure to have you. And we have a very special guest today. We have industry analyst Daniel Ahmad joining us. Thank you for joining us, Daniel. Thanks for having me on. It is a privilege to have you join us today because today we're going to talk about the price wars of the upcoming next generation systems from Sony and Microsoft. And right now, we really don't have a lot to go on. We have some of the expected bill of materials for the PlayStation 5. But other than that, we really don't know where these two companies are coming in with pricing. Though we did get a shock last week at the PlayStation event when Sony came out and announced that they're going to have two SKUs of the PlayStation 5, one a standard system with a disk drive and a second SKU that's going to be digital only. And that caught a lot of people by surprise. And we're operating with this discussion under the idea that Microsoft is going to have two SKUs of their own, the Xbox Series X and the Xbox Series Lockhart, which is expected to be a digital only solution for Microsoft. So we're gonna start today's discussion with some price expectation for both companies. And we'll start with the PlayStation 5 first. So my question to you, Daniel, is what are you anticipating from Sony to come in with pricing of the PlayStation 5 standard edition and the digital version? So I think at this point, you know, there's a lot of evidence we can look to in terms of the build materials. So we we know, for example, that you know this is using a custom SSD. We know that it's got all these new next gen features, for example, ray tracing built in. We can sort of estimate so we we can sort of look at how Bloomberg uh, covered the PlayStation 5 build materials too, where they said you know, they're trying to keep it around 450, but they might be pushed a bit higher than that. Mm -hmm. And so take all of that into account. You are looking at something that is going to be more expensive than the PlayStation 4 launch price, which was 399. The only way that they would price it similar is if they are taking a loss in the console. And I think it's worth bearing in mind that whilst PlayStation 4 did sort of have a loss in its first few months, the build cost was still less than the actual um, price of the console itself. I think the build cost was around $381-ish. Mm -hmm. And the um, PlayStation 4 was obviously 399 But there was a slight loss there because of the other additional costs involved, such as packaging, shipping, et cetera, retailer cut. So based on everything we know, I think you know we are going to probably look at something closer to $500. Uh, maybe not more, maybe not significant more, but I think under five hundred dollars should be sort of where we expect it to come in. <laughs> and three ninety nine is probably going to be a bit of a stretch, but depends how competitive they want to be. Now, do you think the digital version will come in at you know maybe even the same price, but maybe a larger size SSD, or do you think it, if it comes in at a lower price, it'll just be like a fifty dollar differential? So the Blu-ray drive itself, sort of a bulk cost will probably cost around $20 per unit. So you're not saving a huge amount by taking it out, barring any sort of other changes to the design or um, you know internal design that might make it a bit cheaper. But, you know, so if, if there is sort of a differential in, in price, you're not talking $100, you're talking maybe $50, maybe $30 at a push. So yes, it could be cheaper. Do I think there will be a larger hard drive? Given they've only talking about the 825 gig hard drive, so the custom SSD, I, I don't think we'll see a larger hard drive version at launch. Maybe in the future when they can get the price down. But I think right now they're sort of trying to standardize the console as much as possible mm -hmm. so that, you know, there are sort of these two good options on the market for users. And, and yeah, so maybe like a $30, $50 difference in price and the aim will sort of be to upsell to the disc version, 
mm-hmm. and try and get people to see the value in paying a bit extra to get, you know, maybe a, a better or fuller experience. Right. Now, what I would be curious about, do you, could you foresee possibly Sony, maybe let's say, let's assume they price both at $500, but maybe Sony goes out of their way and they include a membership to PlayStation Plus or PlayStation Now, or even a second controller in one of the SKU options to, you know, kind of create that perception of additional value to entice the consumer to sway to whichever model Sony has more interest in selling. Yep, they could do that. I mean, the, the, the appeal of the digital version to consumers is that, you know, this is something where you don't need to go out and buy a disc. You can manage your library completely online. And the benefit for Sony is that, you know, they don't, they don't need to sell their games into retail as much as they did before. So if you look at sort of the gross margin on games being sold at retail versus digital, you know, a, a publisher might get a gross margin of 55% of that $60 game price if they sell retail because, you know, they have packaging costs, they have production costs, they have to give, you know, a set amount to the retailer to sell their game. Um, so they get about 55% uh, return. But on a digital version, the publisher is getting 70%. So 15 point uh, difference wow. in terms of what they get. Mm-hmm. And that means that a publisher selling a digital game it's a lot better for them in terms of you know how much they make, uh, and that is why there's this incentive and has been this incentive, you know, for years now, to sort of push digital copies of games over mm-hmm. physical copies. I get the feeling that Sony is going to start pushing the the physical edition as the more expensive one, and maybe you know, and, and my gut is, and you know. I, I don't have the, the, the numbers that, that Daniel does to, to back it up, but my gut is they're going to have $100 between the two systems. And I think ultimately they want the digital system to be the, I guess, the one that everyone buys over time. And that one is, I think, what Sony ultimately wants to be their kind of de facto or they, their default system. I would expect to see that the physical system is really there to, you know, to keep the the PS4 fans happy, the backward compatibility side of the house, you know, push pushing on. But honestly, I think this is the last generation of a console with a a physical, you know, optical drive uh, built into it. I think, I think really what we'll start to see is the the digital system just kind of take over and just become the the standard system over time. So I, I think that Sony is going to entice people to the digital system. A lot of people may not initially go for it, but I think slowly that's that's where things are going to head. You know, I agree with what you say in terms of Sony wanting to push the, the digital console more. And, and there's different ways to do that. You know, they can price it significantly lower, but I think... Doing that is a bit of a risk to Sony in terms of their profit margin on hardware. Mm-hmm. Yes, they can make it up in terms of digital game sales, but do they really want to, um, you know, go for a price war in terms of in terms of hardware? And maybe lose out a bit in terms of profit. And I, I think the other way they could try and do it is, as was mentioned before, where they bundle in maybe you know three months of PlayStation Plus or a PlayStation Now subscription to the digital version of the console to say, well, look, if you buy the digital version, maybe at the same price or maybe a bit less, you actually get a bit more um, in terms of content, in terms of services that can, you know, make it more attractive to to users, really. What about um, the licensing of, you know, if you buy a, if you don't, you you mentioned the bill of materials for a 4K Blu-ray player was quite cheap, but isn't there also licensing that's involved as far as you know if you want to play uh, if you want if you want a Blu-ray player device, then you're also paying for a license as well. I know that there's you know licenses like that in the past. Is there any kind of cost associated with that as well? I guess the question is: is it truly a you know an eighteen dollar kind of you know bill of materials price difference, or is it also kind of like hidden licensing costs as well that we're not thinking about? So there are licensing costs, but as far as I'm aware, and you have to check this after the podcast, but because Sony is one of the founders of Blu-ray, mm-hmm. I don't think either they, I, I don't think they pay it or that, you know, it's not as costly for them. Right. But I know, for example, Microsoft, when they started having a 4K uh, Blu-ray player in with the uh, Xbox One, they, they had to 
you know, sort of pay our license fee. Yep. That goes back to the, uh, I'm, I'm getting all old school and retro, but the original Xbox had the DVD dongle. You're actually paying for the license on yeah. on the on the, the remote itself. So they, they didn't want to, you know, cover the cost of the license on the box to, to kind of save on money. So I guess now what would be an interesting pivot is going to the pricing that we could see Microsoft go with the Xbox Series X and the long rumored Xbox Lockhart, which again is supposed to come in as just a digital only variant and also a weaker, for lack of a better term, variant of the Xbox Series line. And I would assume right now, based on the technology that the Xbox Series X has been announced publicly, that we're probably looking at a very similar price point of $500 coming from Microsoft, especially because they want to remain competitive with Sony in the pricing of their next generation system. Do you think $500 sounds like a fair entry price for the Xbox Series X, Daniel? I I think we could see it somewhere around there. Uh, Ultimately, I think the build cost will be slightly more than the PlayStation 5. How much more? You know, I think that's hard to say, but we should be looking at something where it's either the same as the PS5 or slightly more. I don't expect it to be 599, maybe 549 in a push, but 499 would also make sense. I th- the Xbox. Oops, go ahead, MVG. I was going to say I, I don't think they can afford to go over five hundred dollars. You know, even even if they, like you said, Nate, even if they add some some sweeteners into the deal, like they'll they let's say for example they give you a year of Game Pass for free, or maybe throw in a second controller. I mean, even those things would make it. I mean, I mean, hey, having two controllers on on a console and a year of Game Pass. I mean that that I mean, there's a lot to to, to like about that, but. You know, the average person on the street, they're not going to pay over five hundred dollars for a for a, a brand new system. I mean, the enthusiasts like us, sure. I mean, we'll get one day one, but I think for Christmas, you know, this year, assuming there is, um, you know, enough supply to go around, it's it seems like a hard sell for me that they go over four ninety nine. Yeah, you definitely have that psychological aspect of marketing where if you see something at four ninety nine versus. 549 549 sounds like a lot more money and it really is only you know fifty dollars but seeing that 500 dollar right. mark mm-hmm. it plays a psychological role in it where you're sitting there saying well that's expensive and having that four right after the dollar sign will play a big role in kind of selling it to consumer and we've already seen microsoft hit you know a lot of obstacles and hurdles with the xbox one versus the ps4 because they did come in at a higher price mostly due to connect and they never really recovered from that more premium priced for, I mean, let's be honest, lesser hardware. So they definitely have to nail the marketing and pricing with the Xbox Series X go, you know, going forward. And I guess that's why we have the Xbox Lockhart SKU, though we it hasn't been officially announced, but we're going to operate for the sake of this discussion that it has been made official. Now, the rumors all say it's going to come in with less power, digital only, how much of a value do you think Microsoft could come in with the Lockhart compared to Sony's digital version? Like, are we talking maybe this could be that hundred, hundred fifty dollar, maybe even two hundred dollar less range from a five hundred dollar price point where Microsoft comes in with Lockhart at, I mean, at two ninety nine? I think it might be a bit of a push for two ninety nine. You know, whilst it is yes a lower end version or a low powered version. Mm-hmm. It's still going to have those same features. For example, an SSD ray tracing. It's it's essentially aiming for the same features on, on Xbox Series X, but at a lower price point and you know at a low resolution. Um, so maybe fourteen forty p versus four K. Mm-hmm. To give a rough example of how two games might differ, um, but with all the same sort of software side and hardware side features um, built in. So I think that will drive up the price a bit. But ultimately, yes, this will come in significantly less than the Series X and probably lower than the PlayStation 5, um, even the, the discless edition PlayStation 5. And it's, it's all part of Xbox's or Microsoft's sort of ecosystem play, this generation, yes. where they're saying, well, look, you can enter the Xbox ecosystem and play all these games at any point. So, for example, you, you know, they're, they're giving users choice with a high-end uh, console, so the Series X, 
Then you've got more of a, a low power mid end console, which is your Series S or Series Lock cards. <laughs> they are putting their services across PC and mobile in addition to consoles. So whether it's Game Pass or X, X Cloud, you have that option too. And then, sort of, I think a wild card that a lot of people kind of brush over and talk about is that Microsoft has something called um, Xbox All Access which is their sort of subscription service to the console. Mm -hmm. So you pay like a monthly, I don't know how much it is, maybe like $15 or $20 a month, um, a bit more probably. And then you get access to the console um, on a sort of like a contract, like a, a phone contract with Xbox Live, um, Game Pass, etc. And so it spreads the cost of the console and services over a 24 month period, as opposed to, you know, spending 600 700 $800 on the console on games day one. If we go back to 2013, was it 2013 when they announced the the PS4 and the Xbox One? Um, yeah. Yeah. When, when did they announce pricing? Was it was it already announced at this point, or was it still you know was it kind of later in the year when they announced? I'm just trying to compare this year to the last generation, <laughs> you know, as far as when prices were announced, because this feels like completely different than what I ever remember. But maybe 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 that's not the case. Yeah. I mean maybe maybe they did actually announce pricing later on. So do you remember when they announced prices last time? Yep, yeah, they announced prices around um, so at the E three conferences. Right. Essentially PlayStation um, had a PlayStation meeting in February where they sort of showed off this is what PlayStation 4 can do. Yeah. Um, yeah. Xbox had their events in May and then in June both of them had an E three conference. They said Here's all the games, here's all the pricing, here's all the launch information, and that was it. You could pre-order, you could go away. This year's been very different, or this generation has been very different. People, you know, one big factor being COVID. Mm -hmm. um, that has sort of delayed everything, pushed everything out. And even sort of the introductory events were later in the year. And mm -hmm. we still don't have pricing, we still don't have a solid release date. We know holiday 2020, but you know, that's a, that's a vague range. Yeah. So when do you think we'll we'll see when do you think we'll see the the pricing announced and who do you think is going to go first as far as who's going to because someone eventually someone has to just to you know put a stake in the ground and say okay we're we're going in at 499 let's go and you know hopefully they 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 they're on the they're on the right target you know but do you think it's going to be Microsoft or Sony that that ultimately you know sets the pricing? Well, I can imagine they both want uh, each other to go first because <laughs> it is it is one of those situations where again pricing will play a key role in sort of the early adoption of next gen consoles because you know Microsoft has really caught up this generation in terms of at least having you know better services in terms of Game Pass they are now starting to build out their first party studios so whilst they're not at the same point that PlayStation is in terms of you know, global recognition. They are they are at a point where they can really start to compete a bit more. In terms of who does pricing first, um, I think it's hard to say. You know, Microsoft has their event in July, and then you know they might do they might announce pricing there. Who knows? But yeah, one of them will go first, and I think the other one will try to match or be as close as possible. Yeah. With their sort of high end skew. Do you think they have a couple of different? scenarios up their sleeve that they're willing to you know to use as far as wait waiting on the other companies so for example if microsoft comes in let's say they come in at at 500 499 for the series x and um 299 for the lockhart do you think you know sony would then consider something more you know competitive to that or do you think they're just going to stick to their guns with whatever price they had in mind and then just kind of roll with it so at this point, you know, everything is sort of not set in stone, but, you know, we're at the point where the Series X is being manufactured, the PlayStation 5 is being manufactured. So, you know, these are kind of rolling off the production lines, um, you know, very slowly right now, but it's happening. Mm -hmm. So there isn't a huge amount that can be changed. Um, pricing being sort of the, the one area that can be in, you know, a minor way. And it, it really comes down to, is one of these console makers going to take a loss on day one, mm -hmm. because yeah. traditionally speaking, yes, there has been losses taken on day one, but you know, since like the PlayStation 4, PlayStation 3, 
they've always tried to either price it similar to the build cost mm -hmm. or not price it too low um, to where they are you know, taking these huge losses. Because whilst digital can make up some of that, um, ultimately they do want to be profitable on hardware too. So if Microsoft does come in at a lower price, for example, I think Sony will realistically consider taking loss on their consoles that they can either price in terms of uh, have parity pricing or maybe coming a bit lower. But I don't think we'll see significant differences in terms of pricing in terms of, you know, $100 or $150 difference. Last gen felt like an anomaly when it came to, I mean, because you had Microsoft really focusing on that media aspect of the Xbox where they pushed Connect and they wanted to be the all-in-one entertainment center for your home and I mean, Connect added a lot of unnecessary costs to the Xbox One SKU. It didn't work in Microsoft's favor because the Connect hype kind of dwindled and nobody was that excited to be forced to have a Connect with their Xbox right. One. And it gave Sony a very clear advantage outside of, you know, Don Matrick and everyone else when it came to used games and everything. I mean, Microsoft's messaging with the Xbox One was a disaster from pretty much day one. Sony sold over 100 million PlayStation 4s. I mean, I don't... I, the hesitation here, this generation, is kind of bemusing to me because it seems like it's a cat and mouse game. They're both waiting on each other to see who goes first and, and what, what price gets set and everything. I feel like Sony should be a lot more kind of... I don't want to say aggressive, but it, it seems like they need to be more just you know, the leader, because they are the leader, right, at the moment. So why don't just take the lead and and just, you know, get ahead of this thing? Because they, they've got the loyal fan base. They're going to sell a lot of systems either way, even if they take a loss on, on the console on day one, they're going to make up those numbers over time. So the, the, that's the part that just kind of really confuses me that they're not, and either company, I would say as well. I mean, Microsoft, they're the underdog, I guess, in, in some ways, but they also have a lot of you know a lot of backing behind them as well so why not just take the lead take the initiative and say okay we're going to go with this you know we we know how to make games and sell consoles so we're going to price this thing and, and just go with it ultimately they they do have that option where they can if they want to price it 399 they can do that but it really comes down to um wanting to keep the value of the brand and mm -hmm. also um sort of, um, you know, competition plays a role in, in, in this as well. Mm -hmm. So if Microsoft is not going to price it lower, there's no need for Sony to do that either. Yeah. And because they know that, you know, parity pricing, they're still going to have an advantage over that. Um, maybe not as big as they, they could, but but ultimately they, they want to be able to show that, you know, their PlayStation segment is still profitable, still growing. Um, and that is why they are not so forward with the price this generation, this time around. Of the two companies, who would you say has the advantage when it comes to pricing their hardware and who could take the financial risk with coming in cheaper? Because as we know, Microsoft is a very lucrative company. They have billions of dollars, but they are a little hesitant or adverse when it comes to the Xbox line. They're not completely behind it. They don't view it like their Surface or, you know, like their Windows product line. They want Xbox to succeed, but they also don't want to heavily invest in it, nor do they want to take substantial losses on it. So it's not like the original Xbox back in 2000 where they launched it. And if they were going to lose millions upon millions of dollars, they were okay with that because they really wanted to make the brand something. Now it feels like Microsoft, they can take the loss but they may not want to take as substantial as a loss as they might have been open to in previous generations. So do you think Microsoft might sit there and say, we'll take the loss on the Xbox Series X and even Lockhart because we want to build that ecosystem and we'll get that price advantage over Sony? Or is it really going to be a case of, this is what it's costing us to manufacture. Let's come in as close as we can for either to break even or maybe make a little profit or maybe lose a little bit, but I mean, which of these two companies do you think has the advantage in that realm? Microsoft as a whole certainly has a bit more power there. Um, they can offset some of those losses from other divisions. I mean, if you look at the original Xbox, and I might be wrong here, but 
I think they lost $3 billion over the you know, five-year mm-hmm. period that it was on the market. So, you know, you don't want to go through that again. Sony went through that with the PlayStation 3, where they lost billions on essentially only on because of the pricing. Mm-hmm. Um, we're not going to have a situation like that this time. Um, but I think in general, there's still going to be sort of this push to at least break even, unless they are forced to by competitors you know each other to go to go lower so now since we have touched on microsoft and sony which of the two companies do we really think will come in cheaper or higher of the of the xbox series x versus the playstation 5 when we also factor in lockhart and the digital variant of the playstation 5 do we feel like microsoft will have the price advantage overall moving into next gen with the two SKU approach Overall, I would say yes, uh, only because Lockhart will be priced cheaper. And I'm also including, I'll say they'll offer some type of incentive. For example, mm-hmm. they'll give they'll give you know someone they'll they'll give customers maybe three months of Game Pass for free or some some free Game Pass initiative. Maybe not three months, maybe one month. And I think ultimately they will have the cheaper product, but. I, you know, I also want to be clear that I think that both the Series X and the PS5 will be priced at the same same price, and it really is, you know, the digital systems that that kind of make up the difference there. And I think ultimately Microsoft will have the cheaper product. Yeah, I think overall, you know, Lockhart will be sort of the cheaper or the the best value product on the market if you want to get into next gen. Um, I think that's why Microsoft have gone ahead and, and put that, or will go ahead and, and sort of announce that as their. <laughs> initiative do you think that when sony announced the the old digital or the digital the the second skew assuming phil spencer hadn't seen the presentation before we saw it last week that that they were a little blindsided by that and maybe are wondering whether the lockhart is is the right move now now that basically sony has their digital system which essentially is the exact same PlayStation 5 hardware. So you're going to get that same experience mm-hmm. across SKUs, no matter which one you use. But in Microsoft case, you know, you obviously have a, a lower performance, lower spec, you know, system, albeit in the same Xbox series architecture, but it will perform at a lower level of performance, obviously. So do you think they're now wondering if the Lockhart is the right move, considering basically Sony, I don't want to say they've they've nullified the Lockhart, but they've come up with a, I'll say a pretty good response to to the Lockhart. Yeah, I think the, the digital edition is a very good response overall. If you look at, you know, trends over the past five, 10 years, in the beginning of 2013, before, you know, PlayStation 4 and Xbox One came out, digital sales made up maybe five to 10% of four game sales. Now it's, well, as of Q1 2020 for the PlayStation 4, 66% of full game sales were digital. Mm-hmm. So, you know, we're, we're talking more than half at this point, and that'll probably be the trend going into, ne- into next gen as well. So the digital version certainly has this really great um, sort of value proposition to it. I think it'll be popular um, as, the, you know, the further we go into the generation. In terms of the lock art, I still think it, it's, it's, an, it's a good move. Um, it's not sort of. I don't think they. I don't think PlayStation have nullified it, mm. but I think Xbox is going for a much bigger play in terms of saying, well, you know, we are more about the games and services now than the mm. actual console itself. So even if you have, for example, just a PC, um, or even a smartphone with with XCloud, you know, you can still get a similar experience. And what they're trying to do is not just convert their current base over to the Series X. But bring in you know, lapsed gamers, gamers who don't really have time to play console games anymore, uh, PC gamers, even non-gamers, into thinking that, well, okay, if I have a PC, I can play there. If I don't want to spend $500, I've got a lower-priced Xbox I can buy. Mm-hmm. And you know, if I have a smartphone, I just want to play in the cloud or a PC in the cloud, I can do that. And I think that's a tougher sell for Microsoft overall because there's so many different competing services you know, across the wider ecosystem that Microsoft has to sort of compete with. But if they can do it, then that's great for them. But in terms of the the actual HD console space, yeah, I think PlayStation has a much 
at least right now they have a much better proposition in terms of the hardware and games that they offer. Their show is very good in terms of communicating that, you know, these nine first party, second party games, you can only get them on PlayStation 5. They are tailored for the SSD, you know, for the new system. And then they also had partner games, uh, third parties, indies, for example, Square Enix's project. That is, I mean, to use their tagline, designed for PlayStation 5, whatever that means. But, you know, it, it, they're essentially trying to show that, <laughs> hey, look, we have all these games uh, that you can only get to sort of the best experience or the maybe the first experience on this console. Yeah, Microsoft really hasn't done a good job communicating when it comes to software on their platform, mostly because we haven't seen their real standout showcase yet, which we are expecting to come in July, whereas Sony kind of had their, we'll dub it their E3 showing. They introduced us to the system. They introduced us to what we are expecting to be first year software releases with some beyond that in terms, you know, like Square's project definitely isn't coming out in 2021 if it, if it comes out at all. And we're still waiting for Microsoft to really show software that takes advantage of the SSD and the hardware that they continue to go to social media and tout as the most powerful next generation hardware. And right now we have yet to see that, whereas Sony's come out and they've shown us visual you know, spectacles with games like Ratchet and Clank and Horizon, and Horizon 2. And I mean, Microsoft will eventually deliver. It's just a matter of us waiting for them to get there which has been a little off-putting that Microsoft seems to just, they're just kind of taking it slowly. They don't seem to be in any rush. And that's either a sign of confidence or it's a sign of maybe a little bit of scrambling of, oh, Sony kind of caught us off guard. What do we have in store that we can counter their show? And right now, I really don't think Microsoft has first-party software that can counter what Sony had just shown us last week at their event. Though Microsoft does have a lot of new studios. They have a lot of games in the work. But Sony came out heavy with Spider-Man, Horizon, Ratchet and Clank, partnerships with indies and third parties. And Microsoft is still in that rebuilding phase and they'll get there. Right. But it's just a little too early right now. Now, one thing I do have to ask, when we look at the Xbox Lockhart, what do you realistically see in terms of sale potential for that platform? Because we did see Microsoft come out with the Xbox One SAD and it was overpriced and the you know the gaming community basically rejected it immediately and they didn't really buy into it until it saw a steep price drop i think it's all about the uh the marketing of of the of the system and i think microsoft will do a good job i don't think they're going to make the same mistakes as the xbox sad i mean they they just kind of they just kind of re- revealed that one day if if i remember correctly and they said here it is it's an all digital uh, Xbox One S that no one really wants anyway because they're so under underpowered, you know. So it it didn't really seem like the right move, like you said, Nate, until they actually slashed the price, and then everyone was like, "Yes, you know that that's actually a good deal." I don't think they're going to make the same mistakes with the Lockhart. I mean, I think they're really going to to push that this is a um, a next generation system. It's it's digital. It has. You know all the features that you want it will play you know the halo infinite um at 1080p you know at really good frame rates i mean i, I think this is going to be a, a different you know a different discussion altogether and I, I don't think they're going to just you know um willy-nilly just kind of reveal it at at their now at their you know presentation i think it's it's going to have a a presence at at their show and i think they'll they'll you know they'll d- dig into it a little and and maybe talk about you know the the reasoning behind it and and i think you know i think ultimately it will be priced appropriately i think microsoft won't make the same mistakes as they did with with the xbox ad yeah and, and this is sort of their this is the first generation where we have two consoles or two distinctly different SKUs at launch for a single sort of platform holder and they really want to they, they really will communicate this is a way to get into next gen at a much cheaper price you get pretty much the same experience in terms of games playable, but again, lower price. Yes, it's not as high resolution, but all the same key architecture and features are there to sort of entice users. And so it's one of the many entry points into this bigger, wider ecosystem that Xbox is trying to create. Yeah, I mean, that's where I kind of look at the Lockhart 
because kind of like as MVG brought up, people view the Xbox set as, oh, well, this is the lesser Xbox, you know, Xbox One option. Could Microsoft face that same problem with the Xbox One Lockhart of this is the lesser Xbox Series X? It's lower spec, but it does come in at the, you know, more affordable entry price. And that seems like a tough thing that you have to market of, I guess you would just come out and say, oh, you don't have a 4K TV. You don't need our better, more premium hardware. This entry model is fine for you. It's coming in at, we'll just say $300. It's going to play all the same software. But it's still, at the end of the day, the lesser Xbox option. And nobody wants to feel like they're buying the, you know, the worst SKU available from the company. You always want the best one. So I, that seems like it might be a challenge for Microsoft, even if they try to pivot and position it as, well, this is going to be the system that you're going to use just for Game Pass or to utilize xCloud, because it is a digital-only system, or at least that's the expectation. So maybe by marketing it in that lower way, you still have to nail the messaging of maybe this is more for that casual gamer who's not going to be buying a ton of games each year. You're buying it strictly to play you know, your Madden, your Grand Theft Autos, and you're going to explore Game Pass and all the software options that become available on that service. But it's not really for that enthusiast in the gaming market. Mm -hmm. It's just for the more casual gamer, you know, the person, the 30, 35 year old who just plays Madden or Call of Duty a few games a year. And they're just hopefully, I guess the interest for Microsoft would be you're going to use Game Pass. You're going to discover new games through us and we're just going to keep you invested in our ecosystem in the long term by holding on to that subscription because otherwise i'm not 100 percent convinced of where the lockhart market is basically it, it both companies have that same battle i mean it's really about how they sell their systems you know how to how to basically get their customer base to to migrate to the next generation so how do you how do you get someone to buy a Lockhart that has, we'll say an Xbox One VCR like like you and I do, right? Or how do mm -hmm. you get someone to buy a PS5 digital that has a PS4 or a PS4 Pro? And that is always the difficult part. And I think for Microsoft with the Lockhart, if they, I think their marketing really needs to be, you know, this, you know, you have, a, you have an Xbox One or an Xbox One S, great, but you really want to, you know, to, to get on board with next generation and this is this is your your entry point into that world and i think it's important to look at what we saw last generation as well or this current generation so it, it's only it's only it's only like for like but even after the playstation 4 pro came out you know 70 percent, even almost 80 percent of the sales was still for the ps4 slim as a pro as opposed to the ps4 pro mm -hmm. okay. um the pro is really there as sort of like a top tier console and that's sort of where Microsoft want to pitch their the Series X. But I think pricing does play a bigger role than people admit in terms of if you have a lock card of maybe 300, 350 and you know it has the same experience as the Series X. That's not just appealing to the casual gamer, but also people that maybe didn't have an Xbox before or people who might have bought an Xbox in five years time when it was a bit cheaper. You know, it's really kind of getting that entry point pricing down um, as soon as possible, as early as possible to reach those players who maybe wouldn't buy on day one. And then in addition to that, again, it really does come back to the sort of ecosystem that the Microsoft is building because the Series S Lockhart is this Trojan horse for Game Pass, Xbox Live. They want people to enter this ecosystem and then spend $15, $20 every month on services mm -hmm. because that is where the, the kind of you know bread and butter of microsoft um... now do we think the risk of these two companies by releasing to two SKUs with digital only variants is actually going to pay off for them in the long run like as we've said in this episode lockhart is going to be that cheaper option that should lead to great success for microsoft whereas we're kind of expecting sony's playstation 5s to probably come in close to if not the same price for the two model skew so is the risk of introducing these digital only especially at launch really going to pay off for these two companies in kind of expanding and growing our digital only future 
or do we still see a large percentage of people buying into the disc version PA, PlayStation 5 and a large percentage still buying into the Xbox Series X? Because, I mean, a lot of people still enjoy physical media. You want to have something in your hand that you say, I own. And that's, I mean, that's a challenge in and of itself to convince people that you're buying a game that you don't have physical ownership of, even though the disc day is really just a license. It goes through all the online authentication and such, but you still, I can go to the store and I can resell it. Whereas my digital copy I'm stuck with until maybe a company comes up with a digital trade-in program of some sort. So like, is it worth the risk of launching these digital versions day one with the disc variants, or is it something maybe the companies could have waited six months or a year to? Ultimately, it's sort of where the games industry is heading, has been heading uh, since PC, mobile, now console. And, you know, we're really at that point where people are buying more digital games than physical games. And whilst there is sort of this pushback in terms of, well, you know, I don't own digital games, I don't, I can't sell them, I can't treat them in. Um, a lot of people have sort of looked past that recently, and the value of digital games themselves has sort of been more attractive um, and been a better proposition to a lot of people. So yes, th there is a market for these, for these digital consoles. Will they be the main console selling at launch? Maybe not. Will they be sort of the more popular version five, six years from now, at the end of the generation? I think yeah, we will get to that point where, you know, next generation we could just see digital only consoles because that is the um, overwhelming sort of option that is supported. Uh, personally, I think that, you know, Sony and Microsoft should do more in terms of allowing gifting, allowing refunds. Yeah. Because, you know, whilst that's a, a small part and publishers don't really want to offer it when you think about it, um, it it's still goes towards convincing people, sorry, convincing people to switch to a digital SKU or, or download a digital version of the game. So I think that making digital as friendly as possible will actually get people to switch quicker, which ultimately is the goal of publishers. I think that's what the interesting thing is with the PlayStation 5 is let's, for the sake of the discussion, assume the PlayStation Digital comes in We'll say fifty dollars less. It comes in at four forty nine. Why, as I, the consumer, why would I choose that over the standard PlayStation Five? That's just fifty dollars more, but at least it gives me the option of having a disc drive. So when games do go on sale, be it Black Friday or the holidays, instead of being sixty dollars, I go into Best Buy or GameStop, and the game is twenty dollars. Whereas maybe the digital version sale is only down to you know forty dollars. For an extra fifty bucks, I at least have the convenience of option. I can choose to still buy a disc, but I can still go all digital if I, you know, opt to make that decision. Whereas if I buy the digital only option, I'm stuck with that one decision. I don't foresee Sony releasing a disc drive add-on that we can plug in via USB or anything like that. So that seems like where it's a tough sell where it's I can buy the best of both worlds for, you know, just fifty dollars more. And I guess that comes down to the marketing message where Sony would have to deliver of if you're just going to go digital only, this is the best option because it appears that it's going to be identical. The both systems are going to be identical. So how do you really communicate that you want to buy this version over the disc version if you're going to go digital only because you still have that option? Yeah, and ultimately that is why it's there because right. we're not at the point where everyone is okay with digital or wants a digital only console um, or even could use a digital only console. So the physical version is definitely going to be, you know, at the beginning of this gen, the one that people will opt for, uh, more so. But again, by the end of this gen, that will probably flip. And in terms of communicating the pros of the digital version, it is, again, um, the same reason that people buy digital games today, in that it is very convenient. Um, there are sales, you know, it can be cheaper. And that, you know, people are more than willing to sort of forgo the advantages of, of a of a physical copy because they can take their digital library with them. So <laughs> how, how Sony sort of can sort of, um, you know, communicate to that, I think it'll be interesting to see. Again, we could just see it be as simple as, hey, if you buy the digital version, then you will get 
three months of PlayStation Plus or you know, maybe even a year subscription or something like that, just to sort of say, well, look, this is actually a much better value than just $50, $50 lower. Um, we're actually getting $100 off when you really think about it. But of course, you know, the realistic price is only $50 still. So. Mm -hmm. Do you think it's a good time to be releasing a machine in 2020 given, you know, the pandemic you know, lots of recession, or recession, I guess, in certain countries, lots of unemployment, especially here in the United States. Ideally, it's not the right time. But um, I think there is some truth to saying that video games are recession-proof in that, you know, it's a very low-cost investment for that type of entertainment. And ultimately, there is a very large console game audience that will be there day one that does see games as, sort of a, as an escapism. Mm -hmm. that can afford consoles and that you know will upgrade straight away so I, I don't think it'll impact sort of the early launch um too much but mm -hmm. maybe in 2021 or 22 we could start to see you know sales maybe not follow the same curve as playstation 4 for example and drop off a bit just because the market might not be as big as it once was uh one well, because there's so many different options in terms of Free to play in PC and mobile, um, but two, yeah, you know, recession having an impact in terms of five hundred dollar consoles, not the best time. So, Daniel, <laughs> tell us your uh, tell us your predictions as far as the rest of this year. Who do you think is going to go first? Who do you think is going to announce pricing first? When do you think we're going to see pricing? And when do you think these systems will be announced as far as launch dates? So, the Xbox event in July would likely have pricing. Um, can't say for sure, of course, but mm -hmm. I think that might be where, you know, Microsoft does their big reveal. Uh, Sony will probably do it either that month later, but or, or in August. And I think that August is sort of the cutoff date for both companies. You really want to have at least a three month period to, you know, market the console, take pre orders, see the demand, ramp up if needed or, or run down. So, there's going to be, um, I think, again, this wait and see who goes first. But August will certainly be the cutoff date. In terms of um, a launch, again, three months from August to November. So, yeah, I think November would be sort of the earliest we see it happen. Um, because they'll want to announce pricing, pricing uh, at least three months before. Mm -hmm. Yep. So now... I'll Here's the thing of just kind of random expectation because we we all agree that the likely pricing of both these systems is going to come in at four ninety nine, but let's give three speculative pricing. Let's say the highest we see Microsoft and Sony coming in expected, and then the lowest we could see just for the premium SKUs, so the Xbox Series X and the PlayStation Five traditional. And then we'll do the same for the digital version of the PlayStation 5 and then for the Lockhart. So we'll start with the PlayStation 5 and Xbox Series X. What do we think is the highest price point we could see the companies coming in at? So for PlayStation, probably 499 I don't think they'll go higher. Um, for Xbox, maybe 549 at a push. But ultimately, I think it still will be similar in terms of 499 I would say, I would say Sony could do the the physical PS5 at, at five, 550 or 549 and Microsoft could do the same. I don't think think they will, but I would say that's the uh, the extreme high end for me. Okay. Now, what would you say is the lowest we could see those two come in at? Absolute lowest, 399. Yep. I don't think we'll see anything lower than that. Um, and I think it'll be very rare if it does say it's 399. Okay. Yeah, I would agree with that. Three ninety nine. It, it it there's no way it could go any lower than that. Even three ninety nine is extremely aggressive. Yes, that's yes, yeah, an aggressive move, and they would be taking fairly significant losses on hardware if they did come in at three ninety nine. Now, for the PlayStation Five digital only, are we in agreement that it's likely would be the same price range as the standard PlayStation Five? Yeah, give or take. Yeah, fifteen. Yeah, fifty dollars I think is is probably what it's going to be. But I, I can't shake this one hundred dollar thing, Nate. So you know, 
<laughs> that 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 could happen. And with the Xbox Series Lockhart, what do you think is the highest we see with that coming in at, and at the and then the lowest we see Lockhart being priced at? Um, probably three nine nine being the highest, okay. and two nine nine being the lowest. I think that ultimately there is going to be, and, and again that depends whether it has a disk drive or not, which again won't push it up too much, but it, it, it would be a thing. So ultimately it's going to come down to it, ha it, it, it having an SSD and all the same sort of features and architecture as the Series X. So that's going to end up pushing it to probably 399 maximum. I would differ a little bit i would say 349 99 is is my high end and 299 is probably what i think it's going to be i i think you know daniel you bring up some good points but i can't shake the feeling that you know people are going to have to get on board with the lock card if they're trying to upgrade or you know why wouldn't you just get an xbox one x which is still going to be sold for the next couple of years even though they are seem seeming a little harder to find these days but you know for me sure. you know the xbox one x is still at the moment to today is still kind of the most powerful console so i think you know it can't be too far ahead of the series uh, sorry the xbox one x pricing otherwise it's just not going to work for them so i think i think three three forty nine ninety nine is my high end i mean they did, both companies definitely have some marketing challenges ahead when it comes to the pricing of the two platforms because they do want to look like they're better than the other because as we've seen Microsoft, they continue to go to social media every time they release a press release or even have an event, they keep saying Xbox Series X, the most powerful hardware. And Sony doesn't have a counter to that just yet. But if we look at the specs, Sony could easily come in and say PlayStation 5, the fastest hardware, you know, available. And, you know, it sounds good to the ears when you hear something is the best, whether it be speed. Mm -hmm. Or, you know, just hardware, because what Microsoft really has to demonstrate when it comes to hardware strength or advantage is how big is the actual leap. And so far, they haven't done that. Sony has shown beautiful third party games, beautiful first party games. And all Microsoft has shown us right now is some, you know, mid tier indie games that really didn't demonstrate or illustrate what we're going to see from next generation game performance. And Sony has already done that. But Microsoft does have their July event where we are anticipating them to really show off the visual fidelity and the strength of the Xbox Series X in full when we're going to see Halo Infinite, you know, for the first time. But at the same time, we also have to remember that Halo Infinite is also coming to the Xbox One series of products. Yep. So is the game going to be held back by this current gen hardware or is it being developed with Xbox Series X in mind and it's going to take advantage of all that hardware and all those new features and really deliver a next gen experience. Like everything we saw from Sony is aside from some of the indie games, but from Sony developed games like Spider-Man Horizon, all of those are made with PlayStation 5 in mind. These are not cross-generation games, whereas Microsoft is still committed to cross-generation software. So Sony's kind of saying bye-bye to PlayStation 4 and Microsoft is still clinging to a failed Xbox One line. And it's gonna be interesting to see if software does take advantage of the hardware to its fullest, like we see what Sony is doing, or if Microsoft isn't really going to get into their full stride until you know early 2022, which, I mean, if we're honest here, 12 to 14 months, that can really determine the success of a platform, especially moving you know, into a new generation. If Sony gets a substantial lead in that first year, Microsoft might not be able to recover because they didn't with the Xbox One. But you, you know, it's tough to really gauge the trajectory of consoles that we don't know all the software of, we don't know pricing of. We're just going based on the limited information we have available to us today. Yeah. So I'd say it's a very interesting generation coming up. We've already seen unprecedented situations where, I mean, we're getting deeper into the year. We still don't have pricing information. We still don't know when these consoles are launching. We still have limited software ideas. And we know that development has hit snags due to the pandemic around the world. So while we will get games at launch and you know within that launch window of the first six months, as we've seen Phil Spencer say, any games that are entering motion capturing and such, they've been hit with delays. So what's software going to look like in the second half of 2021 or even early 20, 2022? It's gonna be an interesting generation that we, you know, that we're about to enter because there's a lot of uncertainty moving forward. 
And just going back to the point on sort of cross-generation games on Xbox, um, again, it just comes down to that risk that Microsoft is taking with wanting to you know, maintain and grow its ecosystem because mm-hmm. they have 10 million Game Pass subscribers on Xbox One right now. And not all of them are going to transfer over to Series X on day one. And yep. there's no guarantee that they would, uh, even if they didn't have cross-generation games. So it's about sort of, again, just saying, look, no matter which console you have, no matter which platform you use, um, you still have access to all the Xbox games, the Xbox ecosystem, your friends list. And it's about sort of building out this this big sort of um, service, which can act as a revenue generator for Microsoft on a monthly basis, because that is essentially, and it's the same with Sony in a sense as well, where you know PlayStation Plus is sort of, they I think they gross like $3 billion every year from that. So, you know, th- these are really big subscription services and that's sort of the direction of the industry um, and, and free to play to an extent, but, you know, subscription is sort of where everything is heading um, mm-hmm. right now. Now, let's see, you might be able to settle a debate for us. MVG and I, have a disagreement on this and he says the console wars are still a thing and i say the console wars are over and my (laughs) primary reason for that is when we think of the console wars you view it as oh ps4 versus xbox one and you compare hardware sales going into this next generation i say the console wars are over because microsoft's focus is no longer about selling the xbox box itself it's about selling as you've said the subscriptions to game pass x cloud is to build that ecosystem and we can't directly compare a growing ecosystem of a user base to hardware sales where sony is still committed to selling the playstation 5 box itself so i would say the console wars are over in that sense because we're not going to be able to directly to c- compare the success of xbox series x to playstation 5 because microsoft might have a lot of success in growing that ecosystem and having gamers buy their games on PC or subscribing to, you know, xCloud and gaming on their phones. We really, so, you know, we can't make those one-to-one comparisons anymore. And that's why I would say the console wars are over. I would disagree. Uh, Daniel, my my counter argument before you, uh, you you know, you deliberate on, on this is every time something happens, you know, there's a presentation, there's a reveal, there's a trailer, there's always on Twitter, you know, the other companies firing shots, you know, like Xbox is firing shots at Sony saying all those games that you saw run better on the Series X. You know what I mean? Like there's always, there's all this like, there's little sniping going on over Twitter and, and over social media. And I think for me, it just, the feeling is these these two companies are still, they're still very competitive. They're still, you know, there's still a lot of, a bit of an animosity there even though they're saying you know we're working together and we're all in this together and all that stuff sure that that's true but i also feel like you know when there is a, an opportunity to to uh to go after the other company then that opportunity is taken and that really does remind me of the you know the console wars of the older days you know right and it really depends on how you define it <laughs> so we're talking console wars on twitter yeah that's going to be a thing uh you know <laughs> I don't think that's going away anytime soon. Um, if you're talking about the competition between game companies as a whole, yeah, there's still going to be that sort of console war between PlayStation, Xbox, even Nintendo. Um, you know, just just sort of because they do have consoles on the, on the market. In terms of an overall sort of console war, I think maybe that's dropping away a bit because, yeah, it's really more about you know, expanding beyond just the box. And even PlayStation is doing that as well, with, for example, PlayStation Now, mm-hmm. uh, or even putting it on the PC. So, you know, it's not always just about, especially when you get from sort of a financial point of view, it's, it's never going to be about how many consoles do they sell, but it's more about, you know, how many subscribers do they have, how many active users do they have, how many, um, you know, game sales have they, how many games have they sold, stuff like that. So it, it's always going to come back to, the wide ecosystem on that front, but certainly in terms of, you know, taking a more narrow view and looking at the consoles themselves, yeah, that console was still always going to be there. CMVG, we're both right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and that, that's a good point. We have seen Sony expand their PC reach. Like we've had the rumors of Bloodborne will be coming to PC and we've seen Sony bring some of their own 
software natively to PC. So even Sony's kind of viewing it as we can expand beyond just the PlayStation box and we can make PlayStation a brand where PC gamers can buy into our ecosystem. Though Sony seems to be, they're still dipping their toe in the PC pool, whereas Microsoft dove headfirst into it and Nintendo is still sitting on the deck just looking at it and you know they're afraid to jump in without some swimmies. It's definitely interesting to see how all game companies are evolving. They're noticing that there is a bigger market beyond what they can just get with their dedicated boxes. And we're really seeing that expansion kind of come into play moving into this next generation. And it feels like Nintendo is going to have to be drag kicking and screaming into like PC or to offer their games on other services beyond their own hardware. But eventually I do feel like Nintendo will get there. But I mean, Microsoft is 100% committed to it. They want their games on every piece of you know, every device they can get their games on. We've seen the rumors of interest of Microsoft wanting to bring Game Pass to the Switch and Microsoft's published games beyond, you know, just Minecraft on the Switch. We've seen Ori sure. and the Blind Forest come over. So Microsoft really seems like we'll put our games anywhere as long as we know we can sell them. And Sony is finally also adapting that business model, though it's still limited to just PC for now. I don't think we're going to see them bring like the God of War one and two HD collection to the Switch anytime soon, though I'm sure there'd be a lot of people who'd be happy to see that. But it's really interesting to see how Microsoft and Sony are willing to expand their brands and no longer confine themselves to just their individual dedicated hardware boxes. Right, and if you look at, for example, the PlayStation 2 generation, so PS2 back then, consoles were extremely dominant in mm. terms of revenue. So you had I can't remember the exact split, but you know, console was bigger than PC by a large margin. Today, it's completely different where you have, um, you know, PC and console about the same size, but then mobile is twice the size of uh, console al mm -hmm. alone. So, you know, revenue-wise, there is this huge market that can be explored. And that doesn't mean that they have to sort of cater to, um, you know, micro microtransaction field games or free to play titles. But it just means that there is other devices where people are playing and that if you sort of bring some of those games, HD games, to those devices, um, it can really appeal to, for example, lapsed gamers. So people who used to play maybe on PS3 or PS4, but don't anymore. Um, you know, these are the kind of people that maybe really enjoyed FIFA back in the day, but mm -hmm. they just haven't had time because they've, you know, not even had the money or not had time to to upgrade to a PS5. So being able to stream the game to their PC or download the game on their PC or, or play it on mobile um, is again, a, a big deal for a lot of people. Mm -hmm. And it's just up to Microsoft and Sony to communicate that and say, well, look, this is an advantage and this will work for you. And I think it's up to them to sort of prove that market is there now. Yes, actually here's one topic I wasn't planning on but you kind of sparked the idea in my mind. One of the things that micro, uh, that Sony's been really good at is that they target emerging markets really well with the PlayStation hardware. And moving into this new generation with the PS5 and the Xbox Series X, how big of a role do you think the Chinese gaming market could potentially play into it, especially with these consoles looking more for digital and streaming, which is a bigger thing in the Asian markets than necessarily in Western? Sure. So, uh, in Asia in general, I think that you know streaming can play a big role. We're also starting to see that in Japan, with sort of feedback on XCloud, but also local services there that are doing quite well. Um, and Korea is very similar in that they are you know quite big on console games in terms of Switch games, for example, or PlayStation mm -hmm. games. Um, but it's a very small audience because again, there's barriers to entry in terms of price. So removing that and getting more people to, for example, play on PC or mobile um, is one way to really expand the market in Asia. Um, in terms of China specifically, so we recently released a uh, report on the China console and TV games market there. And you sort of have a similar issue where, you know, console games are popular, but the market is very small because of all these barriers um, in place. So for example, pricing for hardware and software, or for example, the fact that you know, all of the well-known games are on mobile and PC there, and some of the 
franchises that we think are huge here, for example, uh, FIFA, you know, they have PC version that is even more popular. So the console version doesn't really sell a huge amount. Same with, for example, Minecraft. So for console game developers, cloud is going to be certainly one way to get in. And as a sort of taking a multi-platform approach um, to reach players there. In terms of the consoles themselves, sales-wise, um, I think there's a lot of regulatory issues in China as well that we can be taken into account because they can limit the growth of consoles in China specifically. So depending on how that situation goes, um, will depend more on how consoles options sort of picks up next generation. It's definitely going to be an interesting development to see how those emerging markets, especially China, develop into this new generation because like the Middle Eastern market has really blossomed over probably, I'd say, the last decade or so. Because when we look back at like the PlayStation 2, after the PlayStation 3 launched, the PlayStation 2 had huge success in emerging markets. I believe for the first, what, two or three years, the PlayStation 2 was outselling the PlayStation 3 worldwide. Because I think after the introduction of the PS3, the PlayStation 2 went on to sell like, like an additional 50 million units. Yeah, it, it sold better than the PlayStation 3, sold better than the Xbox 360. So, you know, it was, um, it was still doing well in 2007. And beyond. I mean, and that's something that we we don't really see the, that same type of performance from more from the more recent console generations. Like the PS3, PS3 did have continuous sales. It did end up outselling, I believe, the Xbox 360 worldwide. It didn't outsell it in North America. But I don't know. Do you think we're going to see that type of long leg life from the PlayStation 4 as we move into the PlayStation 5 generation, or do you think the market is going to more quickly adapt to the new generation and kind of abandon the current generation once these new consoles are introduced. So one of the key reasons PlayStation 2 sold for so long was because you could just get a hundred dollar version of it, um, <laughs> I think like in 2008. Whereas the consoles right now have certainly held their price um, much better. So whilst they will have a tail, uh, probably better than maybe the PlayStation 3, but um, it, it's not going to be as big um, or as long. Mm -hmm. And I think certainly with PlayStation 5, with cloud, with you know additional sort of entry points into the market, we should see uptake um, sort of maybe a bit quicker um, in the initial sort of first year, but mm -hmm. it remains to be seen. Now, when would you say Microsoft will probably officially abandon the Xbox One? Do you think it's probably by early 2022? Um, honestly, I would say fairly soon. Mm -hmm. I think that Series S lockout will be the sort of entry point, and depending on how they price it, could really replace even the series, um, even the Xbox One X fairly quickly. I would agree. I mean, I think I, I would say maybe a little longer than that. I'd I'd say maybe eighteen months. But I mean, once they're ready to to start, you know, adding a, a date against say Project Mara and um, Hellblade 2, for example, the kind of the, the true next gen titles, I think, you know, we're at that point where it's, it's, they're not going to be thinking about, you know, the Series X, at, uh, sorry, the, the One X at that point. So, yeah, I would say, I would say 18 months is probably the, the limit I would give it. I think we are all kind of a little surprised that Microsoft is even sticking to the Xbox One. Even now, they kind of, I mean, I would have expected them to kind of push it away and make us forget it as quickly as possible. But as we've discussed in this episode, you know, it's still kind of a good entry pro point into their ecosystem. You can still play a lot of those games on Game Pass, like Halo Infinite, which should be coming out later this year. So it still has its role. Yep. But, I mean, I do anticipate that it will be, you know, replaced and forgotten as quickly as Microsoft feasibly can do it. Yeah, so, I, I would say two more years of Madden and FIFA, and <laughs> and that will be it, you know. Yeah, you can always count on FIFA coming out for a few years after the uh, conclusion of a generation. Unless you're the Switch, then you just stop getting them. <laughs> True. So I'll move into some of the Streamlab questions we got this week. Because as people who listened to our last episode, we announced a new initiative that if you donate anything to the Nathan Hate Streamlabs, whether it's a dollar or more, you can ask us a question and we'll answer it at the end of each episode. If you donate $100 or more, we dedicate the episode to you. And this 
episode was dedicated to Shamsa, who gave a very generous $300 to the channel. So thank you again, Shamsa, for your donation. And the first Streamlabs we have is from Mr. Pete 1985 who donated a dollar and asks us, what is your favorite PlayStation 5 meme? Mine is the Pope wearing it in place of his hat. <laughs> <laughs> I like the uh, the cloud one from Final Fantasy. I thought that was that was clever. Oh, yeah. That was a pretty good one. I, I'm particularly fond of the one I put on Twitter on my direct feed account where I took third form Frieza <laughs> and put the PlayStation 5 in as his head. <laughs> Do you have any favorite PlayStation 5 memes there, Daniel? Probably the building ones. I think they're funny. (laughs) (laughs) And we had a donation from Jackson of $5 who says, absolutely love the podcast. Keep up the amazing work. What is a dormant series that you think can greatly benefit from the increased technical capabilities, CPU, SSD, etc., that the upcoming generation offers, and how could it do so? Oh, man, take your pick. I mean, <laughs> the one that came into my mind f- for no real reason other than I want to see it come back is Dead Space. I think okay. that could really benefit from next generation. But, you know, we talked about Silent Hill as well. I mean, there's mm-hmm. there's a lot that, that could potentially come back. You know, um, as far as games that were kind of canceled for technical reasons, I mean... I, I, I hate to say this game, but Scalebound could be something that, that could, could return, you know, and, and it has the actual technology now behind it to to be the game that, you know, that was always meant meant for. So, I mean, there are a couple off, off the top of my head. I think my choice would be Legend of Dragoon from Sony because now you could just render this huge, beautiful open world. You could have dragons and all this really cool stuff. And I'd really like to see Sony you know return to that rpg genre a bit more with their internal studios and legend of dragoon is just one of those series that never seemed to get the love and recognition it deserved for me um i mean it's hard to think of, of like a single ip but it's, mm-hmm. i'm always been a huge like prince of Persia fan uh, mm-hmm. i'm not sure how you would be able to i'm not sure what features they would take advantage of but i think a full of hd you know current gen so next gen Prince of Persia game would be pretty cool, but I doubt that'll happen, so we'll see. <laughs> and then we had a donation from Nintendo Nomics, a good friend of the channel who donated $50 and said, congrats on the growth and success of the podcast slash channel. Haven't missed an episode yet and don't intend to. Embrace the hate. Have a good weekend. Thank you, Nintendo Nomics. Then we had a $3 donation from Commander Kronk, who said, greeting, gents. Both Ghostwire Tokyo and Deathloop are confirmed to be PlayStation 5 console exclusives. Do you think we will see more console exclusives to the PlayStation 5 so developers don't have to compromise their vision by making it compatible with the Xbox One VCR? And I mean, I guess the simplest way to answer that is no, because a third party company does not have to develop a game with the Xbox One VCR in mind. Mm -hmm. They can develop it with Xbox Series X in mind. And like we saw at Microsoft's show, Earlier this year, we had a game from Blooper Team, The Medium, which is Xbox Series X exclusive, and it's not coming to the Xbox One series of product. Yeah, I mean, I totally agree with, with what you're saying, Nate. Yeah, I mean, I think I think Times exclusives will, will be exclusive to kind of next generation going forward. So I don't think there's any real concern that they need to go back and, and worry about you know, targeting for the VCR um, later on. So I think, I think, yeah, you're on the money there. <laughs> then we had a twenty dollars donation from Tiff, who says, "If you two could or would develop a game, what would this game be, and what would be special about it besides from being developed by you two? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I, I'm an old school PC DOS gamer, so I. I don't know if you know if my vision for a game would be anything mind blowing, but I'd I'd like to maybe you know revisit the the kind of the first person Half Life type genre where you've got a really cool story wrapped up in in a first person shooter. I mean that that sounds like pretty much every game that's come out since Half Life, but like do it do it properly, you know, and and maybe. Um, give it give it a really good story and come up with a, a nice 3d engine you know to to make it work as well so yeah i mean I, I i would kind of explore that that type of thing 
I guess I would develop the one game everybody wants, and that would be a real open world 3D Pokemon where you see the Pokemon walking around the environment kind of like a monster hunter because that's that's what everyone wants from a Pokemon game. And, we, you know, we kind of get close to it, but Game Freak aren't, you know, visual mastermind, you know, masterful developers when it comes to visuals and graphics. So that would be my dream, which means it's never going to happen. <laughs> <laughs> Then we had a $10 donation from Lone Ken, who asks, Hello, Nate and MVG. I love your content. I love your take in the industry. There is nothing wrong being a fanboy of X and Y system, but I'd like to take your unbiased opinion into account when I do my research. Thank you for the kind words. Then we had a $300 donation from Shamsa, who just said hi. And our final donation for the week came from Slusher of $5, who asked, I want to donate because I love the show. Have either of you heard anything about the Square HD 2D engine? I know it's actually unreal. Maybe it's my own wishful thinking, but I thought the plan was to use this on multiple games. And that's correct. So far, the engine was used to make um, Project Octopath. And I'm not sure if Square has used it for any other projects so far. I don't believe so. But that's not to say it won't be used with future projects. No. But at this time, yeah, I think Octopath is the only one that, that has it. I, yeah. I, I think it would be foolish if they if they just kind of let it go after Octopath. I mean, I think there's some really good tech there. And, and you know, some of these older older games could really benefit from, from um, this engine, as well as, you know, your IP as well. So, yeah, hopefully it's not the last that we see of, of, the, uh, of the engine. We can always hope that Final Fantasy VI gets a 2D HD port to Switch and maybe PS5 and Xbox Series X after all. It would look beautiful. Absolutely. And that will conclude today's episode of Nate the Hate. I want to thank Daniel Ahmad for joining us today. Thanks for having me on. It was great to uh, speak with both of you. Yeah, it was a privilege to have you join us. And you can find a link to Daniel's Twitter account in the video description below. And as always, thank you for joining me, MVG. You're welcome, man. Thanks for having me on. And it was, uh, it was great to have Daniel on and, and, and talk some, uh, some cool uh, predictions and, and analytics of what may come over the next few months. And as always, you can find MVG's channel in the description below. If you enjoyed this content, be sure to give the video a like. If you didn't, give it a dislike. Let us know your thoughts on the pricing for PlayStation 5 and Xbox Series X in the comment section below and your thoughts on the episode. And until next time, continue to always and forever embrace the hate.